George Orwell. Some of us may call him Nostradamus of the 20th century for his works and specifically for his novel, 1984. For the purpose of this video, I want to accentuate the way he describes two minutes hate. Of course, it is an exaggerated form of governmental propaganda, but no one can deny that in one way or another it exists nowadays in a multitude of countries around the globe. Russia is not an exception. Well, maybe it is, just a bit, because the aforementioned two minutes are prolonged to 60 on Russian state television, as it is the usual length of a TV program. Propaganda in Russia has been a part of our everyday life since the state got hold of all the major TV channels. However, it was not enough to spread the ideology of those in power. The next step was to destroy the institute of free speech by taking control of newspapers, magazines, radio stations. After that, the state started dictating its views upon its citizens. The number of news about domestic problems decreased significantly in just a couple of years. Of course, there are still people who talk about it on local TV channels or free radio stations, but you will never hear the same on federal TV. The whole point of news switched from domestic to foreign. For them, it became important to show us what is happening abroad rather than the inside of the country. It would be okay if they provided us with factual, trustable information, but it would not be okay for them if we saw the truth. That is why the state needed to make people, if not hate, but then surely dislike what they saw on TV. That is how Russians got their enemies of the state. Before we start, I want to present to you these graphs made from the results of one of the Levada Central surveys in Russia. The one above shows the attitude of Russians toward the US, and the one below their attitude toward the EU. You can notice several key dates when the lines on both graphs took drastic turns. And as you can see there are certain differences in the charts, but it is difficult to overlook the long waves common to both charts, which equally determine either an increase in the attitude towards all evaluated objects or its decrease. But since the objects are different, very different, and their policies are different, a simple and important conclusion can be made. The attitude of Russians to all objects primarily depends on the policy of Russia itself, and significantly less depends on the policy of the country that is being assessed. In particular, as soon as Russia arranged an act of direct military aggression against one of its weaker neighbors, then, by magic, both the United States and the European Union turned out to be bad. This is an important feature of the Russian mentality. Russia does not commit any crimes. Everyone around is just slandering it. Let's start with a bit of history. The USSR and its last years. The West saw Boris Yeltsin as a guarantor of Russia's democratic development and stable relations with Western countries. Western leaders supported Yeltsin when in 1993 he sent tanks against the Supreme Soviet, where he timidly criticized the First Chechen War and gave Russia $10 billion in IMF loans ahead of the 1996 presidential elections. In turn, Yeltsin signed a strategic partnership with NATO in 1997, although the Kremlin objected to the alliance's eastward push. Gradually, however, friendship with Yeltsin began to bring great inconvenience to Western leaders, primarily President Clinton. Relations escalated in the spring of 1999, when Russia suspended cooperation with NATO in protest against the bombing of Yugoslavia. Further cooling came in September of the same year, after a wave of publications that people from Yeltsin's entourage pocketed part of the funds allocated by the West as aid to Russia. Despite the diplomatic efforts of Russia, seven Eastern European countries, including Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, were admitted to NATO in 2004 by Putin, according to Vedemosti, as a personal betrayal by US President George Bush and the Prime Minister Tony Blair's Great Britain, whom Putin considered by the time his friends and with whom he was intensively building partnerships. In Blair's memoirs, Putin's reaction to NATO expansion is characterized as an offense Vladimir came to the conclusion that the Americans are not giving him the place he deserves. Twelve years later, in the Crimean speech, Putin noted, We were deceived time after time. Decisions were made behind our back, presented with a fait accomplishment. This was the case with NATO's eastward expansion and the deployment of military infrastructure along our borders. All the time we were told the same thing. Well, this does not concern you.
During the first presidencies of Vladimir Putin, who assumed the top office first as acting president on the last day of 1999, and United States President George Bush, the United States and Russia began to have serious disagreements. Under Putin, Russia became more assertive on international affairs. Under Bush, the US took an increasingly unilateral course in its foreign policy in the wake of the September 11th attacks. The Russian leadership blamed US officials for encouraging anti-Russian revolts during the Rose Revolution in Georgia in 2003 and the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, a year later that was seen by the Putin administration as intrusions into Russia's geographic sphere of interest. Shortly after the Beslan School hostage crisis in September 2004, Putin enhanced a Kremlin-sponsored program aimed at improving Russia's image abroad. One of the major projects of the program was the creation in 2005 of Russia Today, now known as RT, an English-language TV news channel providing 24-hour news coverage. Towards its startup budget, $30 million of public funds were allocated. A CBS news story on the launch of Russia Today quoted Boris Kagarlitsky as saying it was very much a continuation of the old Soviet propaganda services. In March 2007, the US announced plans to build an anti-ballistic missile defense installation in Poland, along with a radar station in the Czech Republic. Both nations were former Warsaw Pact members. US officials said that the system was intended to protect the United States and Europe from possible nuclear missile attacks by Iran and North Korea. Russia, however, viewed the new system as a potential threat and, in response, tested a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile, the RS-24, which it claimed could defeat any defense system. Vladimir Putin warned the US that these new tensions could turn Europe into a powder keg. On June 3, 2007, Putin warned that if the United States built the missile defense system, Russia would consider targeting missiles at Poland and the Czech Republic. In February 2008, Vladimir Putin said Russia might have to retarget some of its missiles towards the missile defense system. If it appears, we will be forced to respond appropriately. We will have to retarget part of our systems against those missiles. He also said that missiles might be redirected towards Ukraine if they went ahead with plans to build NATO bases within their territory, saying that we will be compelled to aim our missiles at facilities that we consider a threat to our national security, and I am putting this plainly now so that the blame for this is not shifted later. In August 2008, United States-Russia bilateral relations became further strained when Russia and Georgia fought a five-day war over the Russian-backed self-proclaimed republics of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Russia's deputy foreign minister Grigory Karazin said in August 2008 in the context of the Russia-Georgia conflict, Western media is a well-organized machine which is showing only those pictures that fit in well with their thoughts. We find it very difficult to squeeze our opinion into the pages of their newspapers. At the start of the mass protests that began in Russia after the legislative election in early December 2011, Prime Minister Vladimir Putin accused the United States of interference and inciting unrest, specifically saying that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had sent a signal to some actors in our country. His comments were seen as indication of a breakdown in the Obama administration's effort to reset the relationship. The 2011-2013 Russian protests, which some English-language media have referred to as the Snow Revolution, began in 2011 as protests against the 2011 Russian legislative election results and continued into 2012 and 2013. The protests were motivated by claims by Russian and foreign journalists, political activists and members of the public that the election process was flawed. The Central Election Commission of Russia stated that only 11.5% of official reports of fraud could be confirmed as true. According to RIA Novosti, there were more than 1,100 official reports of election irregularities across the country, including allegations of vote fraud, obstruction of observers and illegal campaigning. Members of the A Just Russia, Yabloko, and communist parties reported that voters were shuttled between multiple polling stations to cast several ballots. The Yabloko and LDPR parties 
reported that some of their observers had been banned from witnessing and sealing of the ballot boxes and from gathering video footage, and some were groundlessly expelled from polling stations. The ruling United Russia Party alleged that the opposition parties had engaged in illegal campaigning by distributing leaflets and newspapers at polling stations, and that at some polling stations the voters had been ordered to vote for the Communist Party with threats of violence. There were several reports of almost undetectable vote fraud, swapping of final polling station protocols just before final accounting by station chairman. That happened late at night when most observers were gone. Despite the official findings, protests carried on up to and beyond March the 4th presidential election. Shortly after the election of Putin back to presidency in March 2012, the White House spokesman Jay Carney said United States-Russian cooperation was based on mutual interests. In mid-September 2013, the United States and Russia made a deal whereby serious chemical weapons would be placed under international control and eventually destroyed. President Obama welcomed the agreement that was shortly after enshrined in the UNSC Resolution 2118. The Obama administration was criticized for having used the chemical weapons deal as an ineffectual substitute for military action that Obama had promised in the event of use of chemical weapons by the Syrian government. In George Robertson's view, as well as many others, the failure of Obama to follow through on his 2013 red line and take promised military action badly hurt his credibility and that of the United States with Putin and other world leaders. Obama acknowledged Russia's role in securing the deal to limit Iran's nuclear program that was reached in July 2015, and personally thanked Putin for Russia's role in the irrelevant negotiations. On a personal level, the relationship between Obama and Putin went on to be characterized by an observer in 2015 the following way. There can rarely have been two world leaders so obviously physically uncomfortable in one another's presence. The Ukrainian crisis is the collective name for the 2013-2014 Euromaidan protests associated with emerging social movement of integration of Ukraine into the European Union, the subsequent February 2014 Ukrainian revolution and the ensuing pro-Russian unrest. The crisis began on November 21, 2013. When then President Viktor Yanukovych suspended preparations for the implementation of an association agreement with the European Union, the decision sparked mass protests from proponents of the agreement. The protests in turn precipitated a revolution that led to Yanukovych's ousting in February 2014. The ousting sparked unrest in the largely Russophon eastern and southern regions of Ukraine, from where Yanukovych had drawn most of his support. Subsequently, an ensuing political crisis developed after Russia invaded said regions and annexed the then autonomous Ukrainian region of Crimea in March 2014. As Russia's invasion emboldened the Russophone Ukrainians already in upheaval, the unrest in the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts evolved into a war against the post revolutionary Ukrainian government. As that conflict progressed, the Russophone Ukrainian opposition turned into a pro Russian insurgency, often supported and assisted by the Russian military and its special forces. Media portrayals of the Ukrainian crisis, including 2014 unrest and the 2014 Ukrainian revolution following the Euromaidan movement, differ widely between Ukrainian, Western and Russian media. The Russian, the Ukrainian and the Western media were all, to various degrees, accused of propagandizing and of waging an information war during their coverage of the events. Russian channels were repeatedly criticized for the use of misleading images, false narratives, misrepresentation, suppression and fabricated news stories, such as a child's crucifixion and the death of a 10-year-old in Shelling. The BBC reported that Russian state television appears to employ techniques of psychological conditioning designed to excite extreme emotions of aggression and hatred in the viewer, which, according to The Guardian, is part of a coordinated informational psychological war operation. 
A regular theme in the Russian media was that the Ukrainian army, which has many Russian-speaking members, was committing genocide against Russian speakers and that they strongly desired Russia to protect them against Kyiv. This presentation contradicted a poll showing that less than 20% of Eastern residents wanted Russia's protection. They supported Russia's denials of involvement in the Crimean crisis, until Vladimir Putin boasted about the key role of Russian soldiers and continued denying its involvement in the war in Donbass, despite evidence that Russia regularly shelled across the border. According to war reporter and veteran of the first Chechen war Arkady Babchenko, Russian mass media played a significant role in starting the war in Donbass, stating that this is the first war in history started exclusively by Goebbels-like propaganda. Writing in March 2014 for Gazeta Ru, Ekaterina Bolotovska said the Russian media was presenting an apocalyptic image of Ukraine. After a Russian channel claimed Ukrainians had crucified a child in Slovyansk, the former chief editor of Lenta Ru, Kalina Timchenko, said this is an egregious violation of professional ethics. Not only is there no proof anywhere, this has not even been questioned. Writing for Sabisednik, Dmitry Bikov said the language of today's propaganda has become full of artificial connections. If you are against Russia's covert war in Ukraine, then you must be for gluttony against the motherland and for soulless American fast food, only protesting against war because you want foie gras. Opponents of the war in Russia frequently face discrimination and coordinated hate campaigns, with the most extreme example being the assassination of Boris Nemtsov, which his daughter Zhanna Nemtsova blamed on Putin and the Russian media. Writing for Vedemosti, she stated that Russian propaganda kills, it kills reason and common sense, but it also kills human beings. She said that Putin's information machine employs criminal propaganda techniques to sow hatred, which in turn spawns violence and terror. Its modus operandi? To dehumanize the target. During the Crimean crisis, Russian media supported the Russian government's assertion that Russian troops were not involved. Будет ли восьмерка и э, по поводу разговоров? Мы исходим из другого. Мы исходим как раз из того, что мы действуем исключительно легитимно. И я сам всегда уступал за соблюдение норм международного права. И еще раз хочу подчеркнуть. Мы считаем, что если мы даже примем решение, если я приму решение об использовании вооруженных сил, то оно будет легитимным, полностью соответствующим и общим нормам международного права, поскольку у нас есть обращение легитимного президента и э, соответствующие нашим обязательствам и э, в данном случае совпадает с нашими интересами по защите тех людей, которые мы считаем близко связанными с нами и исторически, и э, в смысле общей культуры, связанными тесно в экономическом плане. Это соответствует нашим интересам национальным, защитить этих людей. И это гуманитарная миссия. Мы не претендуем на то, чтобы кого-то порабощать, кому-то кому диктовать что-то. Но, конечно, мы не сможем остаться в стороне, если увидим, что их начинают преследовать, уничтожать, подвергать издевательствам. Очень бы хотелось, чтобы до этого не дошло. блокирование частей украинской армии в Крыму в форме очень похожей на российскую форму военную. Это были российские солдаты. Были Посмотрите на постсоветское пространство. Но да, они еще прям так полно формы, так которая пох похожа на форму. Пойдите в магазин вот у нас и купите там любую форму. Это были российские солдаты или нет? Это были местные э, силы самообороны. Russian channels declared that Ukrainian nationalists from Western Ukraine and Kyiv were assaulting and killing Russians in Crimea. They claimed that a bus in Simferopol was carrying members of right sector who were attacking Crimean residents. Although the footage showed a bus with Crimean license plates transporting men armed with Russian weapons after roads to Crimea had been blocked by Russian soldiers. 
Russia 24 used footage of Maidan Square in Kyiv to support its claims of chaos in Simferopol, Crimea. Claims of violence and suppression against Russian speakers in Ukraine were used as justification for the Russian military intervention in Crimea. Russian media claimed that the Western media ignored the apparent violence and that demonstrators in Crimea were protesting for democratic rights. In reference to this, Russian sources consistently refer to the events as the Russian Spring, harking back to pro-democracy movements like the Prague Spring and Arab Spring. The annexation of Crimea was portrayed as the will of the people and a reunification. Pro-Russian protesters in eastern Ukraine, including those who were armed and had taken journalists hostage, were portrayed as peaceful pro-federalization activists. At the same time, some Russian media were promoting anti-Western and pro-war views. Channel Russia 2 aired a short simulation of a Topol M rocket hitting London, while Channel 5 simulated a conventional invasion on Warsaw, Berlin and Baltic states. The BBC reported that the Russian state media had a tendency to focus on events in Ukraine to the almost complete exclusion of problems at home. In May 2015, Slovak monitoring group Memo 98 interviews Ukraine, and Yerevan Press Club of Armenia completed a report on Russian TV channels for the Civil Society Forum of the Eastern Partnership. Memo 98's Rasto Kuzel observed that Russian media diverted attention from important domestic issues and scared the population with the possibility of a war and the need of Russia to protect itself against an external enemy. In an interview for Deutsche Welle, OSCE observer Paul Picard stated, We often see how Russian media outlets manipulate our statements. They say that we have not seen Russian troops crossing the borders, but that only applies to two border crossings. We have no idea what is going on at the others. On a number of occasions, Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Rogozin and Nikolai Patrushev have given examples of Western prejudice and hostility against Russia. One of these examples was an alleged statement by Madeleine Albright about Russia controlling too much of Siberia's resources. As Russian independent media shortly found out, this phrase was never voiced by Albright, but instead by a former Russian security services officer, Boris Ratnikov, who in 2006 gave examples of what kind of secret information he was able to extract from Western leaders using experimental remote mind control research. Even though the origins of the claim were traced in 2007, Russian leaders repeatedly used it as if it were a real statement. Asked by a journalist about this particular statement, Putin replied that I know this is what they think in their minds. According to linguistic analysis by Vasily Gatov, top Russian politicians started reusing classical language habits of Bolshevik leaders, such as self-questioning, metonymy, and expressions or anecdotes from criminal subculture. Themes of Russia's information war include Russia having the right to a sphere of influence and only laying claim to what is rightfully hers, its neighbors being failed states, Europe harming its economy and security by building ties with them, moral equality between Putin and the West, Western decadence and threats to traditional ways of life, Europe being most harmed by sanctions, Putin's government being legitimate and successful, and obscuring Russia's role in post-Soviet crisis by presenting them as ethnic conflicts. Descriptions of the Ukrainian government as illegitimate or self-appointed and the country as fascist were common in Russian reports during much of the conflict, but had declined sharply by the end of 2015. Ukraine was the main subject of negative reports until the Russian media shifted their attention to Turkey. Following Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea, a significant increase in Russian propaganda was noted by NATO. In February 2017, a fabricated audio recording of NATO Secretary Jean Stoltenberg supposedly interacting with Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko was published by Russian news website Life.ru. The supposed voice of Poroshenko was revealed to be Russian pranksters. Russia has been accused of comparing Ukrainian nationalist fighters in Donbas to members of ISIS. Political scholar Nikolai Kozhanov has claimed that Russia has used propaganda to convey nationalistic as well as pro-Assad messages during the Syrian civil war. Kozhanov claims that Russia has made an effort through propaganda to paint Russia and Syria as a stable force in the struggle against instability caused by the Americans and terrorism supported by the US regional partners. RT and Sputnik News Agency are also accused of spreading false information. 
In the downing of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, the Berlinic Card website of Elliot Higgins gave evidence about the manipulation of satellite images released by the Russian Ministry of Defense, which was used by RT and Sputnik News Agency based in Edinburgh, Scotland. The Berlinic Card investigation team's forensic analysis revealed that Picture 4 was digitally modified with Adobe Photoshop CS5 software. It is highly probable that clouds were digitally added on the left and right sides of the image, which obscured details that could have been used for additional comparisons with historical imagery. A new social contract between the elites and the people has taken shape in Russia. It boils down to one thesis. If you don't like living in our beautiful, great Russia, leave the country immediately. A more vulgar version of the same proclamation sounds like this. If you don't like it, get out. Don't like the laws passed by the State Duma? Don't like the same faces on TV? Theft? Mercedes cars and beggars on the dirty streets? Blocked websites and sickening propaganda on state TV? Well, you know what to do. Kirill Martinov, Novaya Gazeta, 2014. Russians' views toward the US briefly improved after the election of Donald Trump, but they have fallen to levels last seen near the end of the Obama administration. Only 26% of Russians now have a favorable view of the US, down from 41% in 2017. Among Americans, just 21% see Russia favorably, similar to the share who had a favorable view after Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea, 19%. The Levada Center and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs conducted a joint study of the mass attitudes of the population of Russia and the United States. According to the poll results, four in five Russians believe that the United States is trying to damage Russia's geopolitical interests. The media have undoubtedly played a decisive role in the formation of this view, tapping into a whole set of fears and traumas inflicted on Russian society after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Вот эта ненависть к России, ненависть к русским, русофобия лежит в корне современной украинской государственности. Вот это они в качестве фундаментального кирпича положили в основание новой страны. В атмосфере русофобской истерики, которая сейчас э, царит в США, э, ее арестовали исключительно и только за обладание российским паспортом. Это является частью общей э, русофобской, э, в общем-то, пропагандистской машины, э, которая здесь развернута буквально на всех направлениях. Пресса британская пишет о том, что вот, мол, Россия разваливается, замалчиваются любые достижения э, и вытаскивается только негатив. Привычная в европейских СМИ русофобия – это ведь та же самая ксенофобия, которая в Европе в Европе считается как бы неприличной, но она существует. Реальная схватка идет по истерической, она уже стала истерической, попытки любым способом поставить Россию на колени. Два проекта у них было. Почему мы об этом не пишем? Гарвардский и Хьюстонский. Гарвардский они выполнили. Растянить СССР на 15 частей. Не надо говорить теория заговора, это... Реальная политика. Они это делают уже. Теперь остался Хьюстонский проект. Это о чем? Растянит действующую Россию. Мировой заговор против россиян. На полках наших магазинов продается хлеб, способный уничтожить человеческую популяцию за три поколения, утверждают ученые эзотерики. Обычная запорожская школа номер 106. Детям, маленьким деткам в третьем-четвертом классе учителя предлагают на уроки природоведения кормить синичек, потому что они желто-синие, украинские птицы, и всячески избегать поддержки, а еще лучше охотиться на снегирей, потому что снегирь вот. это птица, что символизирующая клятую Россию. 58 видов геев! 58 видов! Люди добрые! Где мы видели, как мы одного отличим от другого вообще? 58 видов трансвеститов! В Европе. По школам Украины в приказном порядке пошло требование согреть солдатов АТО. Как? Кровь российских младенцев. Украинское государство как таковое было создано в Советском Союзе. Его не было. Еще раз повторяю, понимаете, ну, а кто ехал открывать и обживать Америку? Авантюристы из -за Старого Света. Разбойники, пираты, гангстеры, ковбои с длинными кольтами, 
а весь американский цивилизационный уклад построен на технологии насилия. В 1990 году, как известно, Литва в одностороннем порядке вышла из состава СССР. Этот выход не признал ни Советский Союз, ни кто бы то ни было еще в мире. На секундочку, этот остров оказался у Дании благодаря Советскому Союзу. Потому что его в ходе Второй мировой войны захватила фашистская Германия, а освобождали его советские войска. Российский Боинг сбил украинский штурмовик Су-25 ракетами воздух-воздух. Боинг сбили не с земли, а с воздуха, предположительно истребителем МиГ-29. Его контуры хорошо читаются при увеличении. Вероятной целью украинской ракеты, попавшей в малазийский Боинг, мог быть самолет... New reasons were added to old wounds. Personal sanctions against politicians, which were presented by the media as an insult directed toward the whole country. Numerous diplomatic polls, even spats over Russia's participation in cultural and sports events, such as the Eurovision Song Contest or the Olympics, which have acquired a political dimension in the eyes of the public. According to the Russian survey, the following reasons determine today's opposition between Russia and the United States. The remaining options register at less than 5%. Russia is a geopolitical rival of the United States. It has always been like this. The West imposed sanctions against Russia. That's what they saw in the news. This is my opinion. In fact, we can talk about three groupings of answers that represent the most common clusters of public opinion. In the first group, Russia and the United States are described as ontological opponents because proponents of this view claim the very nature of international relations presupposes a belligerent rivalry. This idea is the most common one, and apparently also the most stable. The second group of answers included rational explanations. In addition to the most frequently mentioned option, the anti-Russian sanctions, respondents recall various US interventions in other countries' affairs. The scandal with the eviction of diplomats and now the Olympic scandal. Altogether, these reasons were mentioned by 30% of Russians surveyed. Reasoning in the third group of answers refers to external authoritative opinions. On the one hand, this is how respondents may express their lack of interest in the topic. On the other hand, it is a statement confirming one's own incompetence and inability to understand complex issues, which are seen as inaccessible through everyday experience. Although relations with the West are now far from excellent, about half of Russians want a departure from the policy of containment and would be open to developing cooperation with the United States. By contrast, in the summer of 2016, only one-third of Russians thought so. In Russia, the United States is accused of meddling in Russia's internal affairs by 78% of survey respondents. Why then is the openness of ordinary Russians to cooperation growing? Despite the efforts undertaken by state-controlled television channels to portray the deterioration of living standards in Russia as a result of destructive activities by Western rivals, America cannot remain a target of hatred indefinitely. The intensity of emotions will inevitably subside, though their tone will remain negative and watchful. The joke that the broken light bulbs in the corridor are the responsibility of the American president does hold a considerable part of the truth of Russian life. The public media takes every opportunity to imply that the nation's economic troubles can be traced to transatlantic influences. However, to recognize that Russia's economy depends on the interference of other countries means acknowledging one's own importance, which is why the country's leadership has to use evasive phrases and imply that the sanctions have affected the situation, but perhaps not so much. The problem of propaganda will always be important, as those who have power will always try to keep it as long as they can, and propaganda is one of the ways to do it. Russia, a country that lost its strong and fearful reputation on the world arena, a country that still tries to appeal as great and respectable for its citizens through lies, can serve as a perfect example of how things should not be. Obviously, we are not alone in this. There are many countries in the world with the same problem, but none of them have the same history and reputation as Russia.